you know, everybody thinks that milk builds strong bones. And there's good reason for that, because the dairy industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars over a very long time <laughs> convincing us that it's true. But actually, dairy doesn't build strong bones, and we have a number of studies showing that the more milk you drink, the more fractures you get, the more dairy products you consume. It doesn't matter if you consume it in the form of milk or cheese or butter or whatever you're eating it in. Um, it still leads to fracture risk, and that in countries where dairy products aren't consumed and calcium intake is significantly lower, you see a much lower risk of osteoporosis and fractures. So that sounds counterintuitive, but one of the reasons is that um, one of the things, there are many things that build strong bones. Exercise is one of them. Having a good functioning gastrointestinal tract so you're absorbing nutrients from food. Sunlight so you produce vitamin D. So lots of things that contribute to strong bones, but one of them is uh, not putting demands on your body in, or in order to maintain um, a blood pH that's in a, a safe range, okay? So when people eat a lot of what we call high acid load foods, like eggs and meat and dairy, um, if you're living on that kind of stuff, your body has to work very, very hard to make sure that your blood pH doesn't drop below 7.35, because if you stay there for very long, you won't be alive. So what the body will do is borrow buffering chemicals, uh, substances rather, from the bones, like calcium, uh, Calcium's a known buffer, and, um, and you do enough of that, and you will start to demineralize your bones uh, just in an attempt to stay alive. So the best thing to do if you want strong bones is not to eat dairy. It's to eat optimally, eating a low-fat, plant-based diet. Get out in the sunshine and, um, and uh, exercise. Uh, multiple sclerosis and all autoimmune diseases are, have a very strong dietary component. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, it appears that saturated fat and dairy are both um, precursors, strong precursors to the development of multiple sclerosis, particularly in genetically susceptible people. Um, the reason why saturated fat plays such a great role is that the same type, the same mechanism that causes injury to the vessels, the blood vessels in the body, causes injury to the myelin. Uh, that, um, that coats the nerves. And uh, it's another very preventable disease. I mean, we have you know, half a million people in the United States that have it right now. Average cost for drug treatment, which doesn't help at all, is about $56,000 a year. And uh, it, it's, a, it's one of those diseases like stroke where you have the potential to become completely disabled and a burden on your family. So completely preventable. And in many cases, particularly at early stages, can be arrested with a good diet. So, so many diseases uh, are a result of damage to our gut microbiome, which we don't talk about often enough, but I'm incredibly fascinated with, all right? So, in your, in your gut, you have 100 trillion bacteria. A healthy person does anyway. Now, to put that in perspective, you have only 37 trillion cells in your whole body. So, there's more of them than there are of us. They're really not part of the body. They're like renters. They're renting space from us. All right, so what these little critters do down there is several, several functions that are important. They help us absorb nutrients from food. Um, they keep things out of the bloodstream that shouldn't be getting in, and they also are a signaling system for our immune system. So when these critters get destroyed, uh, many bad things can happen, including immune dysregulation. And so how do we uh, end up with destroyed gut microbiomes? Well, one of them is antibiotics, and we're increasingly using broad-spectrum antibiotics, which wipe out all the bacteria. They're not selective for the pathogen that's causing your infection. They wipe out all the bacteria, including the gut bacteria, which makes a person much more susceptible to a number of things, including anything that involves dysregulation of the immune system. And conditions that involve dysregulation of the immune system are asthma, allergies, autoimmune disease, or um, the other side of that, those are uh, um, conditions where the immune system is misbehaving in an overactive way conditions where people are having, uh, that involve the immune system behaving in an underactive way would be serial infections. You know, the person who says, I have six or seven sinus infections a year, that's your, your immune system just not able to mount a response. Or cancer, profound failure of the immune system. So that's the relationship. Now, why would dairy come into play in what I just said? Well, here's the thing. Dairy products, particularly in children, tend to um, cause ear infections. That's almost become a rite of passage for kids. They start getting ear infections. Well, what do we give to kids with ear infections? Antibiotics. 
the antibiotics wipe out the gut bacteria, which makes it likely that the child will get another ear infection, which causes more antibiotics, and you have this vicious cycle where the child gets sick again and again until one fine day the pediatrician says we probably should put tubes in those ears uh, because of the chronic infections, totally unnecessary. And we have some research that shows that for kids who have serial ear infections, that if you just take them off the dairy, if you don't do anything else but take them off the dairy, they get better and often don't need the tubes. But if you take them off the dairy, put them on a health-promoting diet, and give them probiotics to restore that gut bacteria, they get all the way better. We have to be careful that we're using the science in the right way. Uh, we aren't always using science in the right way because everybody goes to reductionism. You know? and, and a good example of how things get misconstrued is that we know that the gut bacteria, the composition of the gut bacteria in an obese person is different than in a normal weight person. And we also know the reason for it because it, how the, bac the bacterial composition depends upon what you eat because you can preferentially feed pathogens or you can preferentially feed the um, positive, the healthy bacteria. Well, you have a whole contingent of people out there that are saying, gosh, maybe if we gave probiotics to overweight people, they'd lose weight. Always going to the simplest thing that involves no work on behalf of the human. Gosh, if we could fix all the overweight people in the country with probiotics, wouldn't that be fabulous? You and I would buy stock in a probiotic company for sure, but um, it's just not that simple. And so we have to be, we have to be grateful for the research and, and diagnostic technology we have and all the scientific discoveries, but we have to make sure that we use them in the right way. Another thing I should add about the antibiotic issue is that when people think about taking antibiotics, they think about going to the doctor, being diagnosed with an infection, or claiming to have one. Sometimes there's not much in the way of diagnostics, it's just here is an antibiotic. Um, and then going home and taking the pills. But there's another way in which people take in a lot of antibiotics and they don't really realize it. Um, and I have people, by the way, who will say, I have never had an antibiotic prescription and I can assure them that they probably have been taking antibiotics for years. And that is the antibiotic found in the food. You know, for a very long time, the FDA ignored this and, and even made statements about that this didn't impact human health. But the reality is that we think about 75% of all the antibiotics made in the United States are given to farm animals in their feed. And the reason it's done, it has a twofold purpose. One is to prevent infection um, because these animals are living in such close confinement that if you have one infected chicken and there are 10,000 in the building, you, you can't kill off all the chickens. The other thing is this discovery was made in the 1940s, believe it or not, and that is that giving animals, fish, whatever, antibiotics causes them to uh, grow bigger and faster. So um, right now the average chicken gets to, goes to slaughter in 40 days instead of 10 weeks, and it's in part due to the antibiotic in the food. Well, this antibiotic residue is left in the food um, that we eat. It's in the chicken breast. And, um, and what the, there's, there are upper limits, by the way, on how much of an antibiotic can be in the food. So how the farmers get around all of this is they buy these big bags of antibiotic at the farm store. And they don't need a prescription for this, by the way. Anybody can go in and get it. And it, the, the bag is filled with lots of different types of antibiotics so that you don't hit the upper limit on tetracycline or amoxicillin. But, but the overall amount of antibiotic in the food is significant, and it's one of the leading causes of antibiotic-resistant infection in our country right now. So it's very scary. Um, we're starting to see people who develop infectious diseases that antibiotics can't help. And there really aren't any on the horizon that, uh, in the development stage that can solve that problem. So the only way we can really address this is twofold. Um, doctors need to prescribe less antibiotics. Patients need to stop asking for so many antibiotics because the doctors are sometimes in an uncomfortable position where patients are saying, I have an infection, you better give me an antibiotic. And then we've got to stop purchasing food that contains antibiotic, which means that if you're going to consume animal foods safely, you have to, uh, have to buy organic uh, animal foods. Um, it's going to be hard to get farmers to stop doing it because, uh, unless you pass a law, which isn't going to happen, because they make so much money getting a chicken to the amount of food you save and everything else, getting a chicken to slaughter in 40 days instead of 10 weeks, that they're never going to voluntarily give this up. So consumers really have to stop buying it.